So I want to move on to Dr. Julie Harper, who is in practice in Birmingham, Michigan. She's a great lady, she's a great speaker, and she's going to bring us up to date on utilizing some of the hormonal therapies for acne. So we're going to talk about acne, not just in adult women, but in women in general. I have no relevant conflict of interest with this particular talk today. So we're going to talk about this for three reasons. Number one, I like the subject. That's the most important. Number two, acne is so prevalent in women. When I was on faculty at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, uh, we did a survey in our multi-specialty clinic and we had one of our then medical students, who's now a dermatologist, go through the waiting area, and she asked over a thousand people to recall having acne at different times in their lives. And it was true that the men and women recalled having acne at about the same level in the teenage years, but at every time point afterward, guess what? Women reported having statistically significantly more acne than the guys, and that's what you see on this graph here. So we're also talking about this because it is such an important part of the population of acne that we treat. And then thirdly, we're talking about it, and this is probably the real reason, because there's a group of medications that we can use in our female patients that we just don't use in the guys. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now we should keep in mind, while we're talking about hormonal treatments today, how many of you guys prescribe either birth control pills or spironolactone for acne? Yeah, pretty much all of you, I can tell you, Ten years ago, when I would ask that question, it was a very different answer. So this is something I think, particularly with birth control pills, that we as a specialty are getting more and more comfortable with. But we should keep in mind that while we're talking about using these hormonal therapies, acne, as we've heard from both Jim and Hillary this morning, is a multifactorial pathogenesis. So very seldom are you going to come in with your hormonal therapy and it's going to be your monotherapy almost always you're gonna be using this in combination with other things, maybe topical retinoids or a benzoyl peroxide or even as Hillary just said, with an antibiotic. I will say, and this is based on personal experience, I do think with both birth control pills, more birth control pills than spironolactone, there are a subset of people that once we get them better, we kind of can maintain or, or do chronic treatment, as Jim would say, with just this hormonal therapy. So I think over time, sometimes you can skinny down that regimen and make it a little bit easier for the patient. But right up front, I would always think of these as being part of a bigger treatment plan. So why even use these hormonal treatments? It's because we can block the, uh, the effect of androgen. And if we go back to this slide, androgens at least work on those top two, and they really may have some impact on all of those. But we can either decrease androgen production we can decrease the circulating amount by sponging it up by the binding globulin. We can inhibit 5-alpha reductase, which takes testosterone to a more potent form, or we can block the androgen receptor itself. So let's break this down again. I know I had a big show of hands there. How many of you use spironolactone for acne? How many of you use it for hirsutism? And how many of you use it for androgenetic alopecia in women? So we, there's a lot of use of spironolactone here. So spironolactone is a very effective antiandrogen. It blocks the androgen receptor. It also reduces biosynthesis of androgen in the gonadal and the adrenal tissue. It also, and I didn't put it on here, it does inhibit the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. So it has multiple modes of action as an antiandrogen. It is a pregnancy category C, you all know that. It carries with it the risk of feminization of a male fetus. That would be like pretty much any antiandrogen. So if you put an antiandrogen uh, on, on a pregnant woman and she is pregnant with a male fetus, the male genitalia is not going to develop properly. When do you think that happens? That happens early. It's late, but in the first trimester. We do not want a pregnant woman to be on spironolactone. So we need to be sure we educate our patients. And if possible, don't use this in someone who is going to potentially be pregnant. Circle this last bullet here, and we're gonna to add to it. So the major metabolite is canrenone, and it has been found in breast milk. Now it's been found at a level of about 0.2% of the maternal dose. Did you know that the World Health Organization and the American Academy of Pediatrics say that spironolactone is compatible with lactation. And I think so often we make decisions based on fear and not based on what the real science is. Now, I'm not advocating that you all go home and treat your nursing patients with spironolactone, but if you have a patient and they have really severe nodular acne, this does give you an option that you can use even during uh, lactation. Dosage. 
Many of you probably start right off the bat with 100 milligrams. I would challenge you to try to start lower and titrate up as needed. Now that's in acne. I think you do need higher doses in things like hirsutism and androgenetic alopecia. But in acne, start low, maybe 25 milligrams a day. I do that all the time. To some of you, that's a shockingly low dose, but I would challenge you to try it. At the worst case, you're gonna to have to titrate it up. But we do know that higher doses are associated with more side effects. And what are the side effects that our patients tell us about? Well, they may not tell us, we may have to query them a little bit, but irregular periods, spotting, breakthrough bleeding, breast swelling and tenderness, those are definitely side effects that we see more of as that dose is higher. So just be aware of that. Fatigue and headaches, those are also in there. Um, I am a big fan when you can do it, and it's not always, but try to use together a birth control pill with spironolactone in a woman who's of childbearing potential. You're doing a lot of things when you do that. Number one, you're making sure they don't get that ir irregular bleeding from their period. And number two, you're preventing pregnancy. And that is, and we have some data, and we can talk about it later if somebody has a specific question, but there is an article that specifically looks at combining spiron spironolactone with, I'm gonna use a trade name here because the, the generic names are too long. They used it with YAS, and that was in archives before it became Jamaderm. But they used those two together and showed that they were able to do that safely. All right, this question always comes up. Do we check potassium? Well, at my low doses, my answer is usually not. That may shock you too. It seems to be maybe the more conservative approach to say, yes, I check it. But I've found in low doses based on experience and then based on some articles like the one we're looking at here, that with low doses, I don't, I don't find it. I don't find hyperkalemia. This is an old article by now. This was published in 2000. 85 individuals in this study on spironolactone alone or in combination with either a birth control pill or an antibiotic, they were on pretty low doses again, 50 to 100 milligrams a day of spironolactone. And at the end of the study, 73 of them had their lab checked. In this particular study, Dr. Shaw found mild, clinically insignificant hyperkalemia in 10 of the patients. And so based on this and based on the dosages they used and the dosages that I used, I do not routinely check potassium but you should check in certain instances. For example, older age, and I really hate to say it, but older age may start as early as 50, darn it. Uh, history of renal or cardiac disease should prompt you to consider checking this. If there's co-administration of other medications that cause hyperkalemia, like ACE inhibitors, chronic NSAID use, that's one that I don't always think about. Are they taking a lot of NSAIDs? If you're on higher doses of spironolactone, then I would also encourage you to check a potassium level. Okay, we're gonna shift gears now and talk about, not potassium, but about the boxed warning with spironolactone. What does the boxed warning say? If you're feeling brave and friendly, whisper to your neighbor what the black box says on spironolactone. You're too well behaved for that, aren't you? I think this is kind of like the whisper game. By the time you get to the end of you know, the, the line of conversation, the story is completely different. I think the black box has been really misinterpreted. This is what it says. Circle this. This is one of the take home star bullet points that I'd like you to remember. You know, they always tell us people remember like three things from your talk. I'd like you to remember this. So the black box says, spironolactone has been shown to be a tumorigen in chronic toxicity studies in rats. Spironolactone should be used only in those conditions described under indications and usage, and unnecessary use of this drug should be avoided. Okay, number one, I've heard Jim Del Rosso very humorously say, take home message, do not give spironolactone to rats. <laughs> Mark that down, circle it, star. Um, this doesn't say that this causes tumors in humans, okay, so we should remember that. It's easy to misinterpret it and say, this drug has been shown to cause breast cancer. No, that's not what this says. Now it does say we should limit this to the indications and usage of the drug. Well, you know what? We're using this drug off label. So we are stepping out of bounds a little bit here. Now I'm not so sure we're using it unnecessarily. Many of our patients who benefit from it would say it's very necessary for their treatment. But what do we know about breast cancer and spironolactone? Because invariably that comes up. Well, here's some studies. Some of them are pretty old now. One looked at 1,475 patients, 1,475 patients, prescribed spironolactone for three to seven years, and there were nine cases of breast cancer, and the aged match, 
age-specific rate would have been about 8.3, so no significant increase there. Another older study, 461 person years of data, three years of follow-up after exposure to spironolactone and no relationship found between spironolactone and breast cancer. And lastly, five case control studies have also found no overall increased risk of, of breast cancer in women who've been treated with spironolactone. All right, let's shift gears now for the next few minutes and talk about oral contraceptives. When we're talking about oral contraceptives, we must be clear we're talking about combinations of ethanol estradiol and progestin. What happens if you give somebody just progestin? What happens to their acne? Right, I just saw somebody on the front. It gets worse, it flares. So we're not talking about a progestin implant. We're not talking about an IUD that has progestin. Has anybody seen that flare acne up? I mean, I feel like I have. We're talking about combinations of ethanol estradiol and one of many progestins. How do these work? Well, you might be using a, a birth control pill that has an, an anti-androgenic progestin, and that helps. But all of them, because they have estrogen, increase sex hormone binding globulin. Remember, that's what binds testosterone, and if you bind it, it can't work at the androgen receptor, so we're lessening the circulating amount. And also, it's kind of just one of those old-fashioned feedback loops. So if you add exogenous hormone, that hormone feeds back to the hypothalamus. Remember that? It tells the hypothalamus, don't release gonadotropin-releasing hormone. If you don't have that, the pituitary does not release LH and FSH. And those are what we need. Remember, like the surges that we need to tell the ovary to ovulate and to make hormone. And so if we can mess up that whole loop, we don't get ovulation and we don't get hormone biosynthesis at the level of the ovary. Now here's a big question, which ones work for acne? Undoubtedly you all have some of your favorites, but I will have to say probably they all work for acne. As long as we're really talking about a combo, if they all are anti-androgenic, they should all work. Now which ones are FDA approved to treat acne? There are four of them. Orthotricycline, and I'm gonna use all brand names here because it's too hard to say, nor gestimate 0 0.18, 0 0.215, 0 0.250, ethanol estradiol, 35 milligrams. I would have to have an extra five minutes just to do that. But it's Orthotricycline, Estrostep FE, Yaz, and B Yaz. Those are the four that are FDA approved, okay? I want you to look at what's bolded here at the bottom, and I want you to circle this and put a star by it. This is a second take home, please remember this. All of the products that are FDA approved to treat acne, all of the birth control pills are FDA approved. Let's read it. Estrostep FE should be used for the treatment of acne only if the patient desires an oral contraceptive for birth control. So we use things off label off the t all the time, but why is it like that? And it's like that in all four of these. It's in there because if you're balancing the risk of a birth control pill to the risk of pregnancy, you win every time. But if you're balancing the risk of a birth control pill with the risk of acne, now you have a very different scale. And so keep in mind, when you're counseling your patients, you have every right to ask, or do you need this for contraception? And if they say yes, you document that in your chart because it changes your risk profile for the rest of the discussion. What are the risks we're even talking about here? Venous thromboembolism is the big one. This is the one that has garnered so much attention recently, but also ischemic things on the arterial side like stroke, myocardial infarction. Risk, I want you to write this down. Write down the numbers three, six, nine, okay? It's one thing to say the risk of a venous blood clot is tripled in somebody taking a birth control pill. I think that sounds slightly alarming. But what if I say the baseline risk of a woman having a VTE, that's a venous thromboembolic event, her baseline risk without a pill is three per 10,000 woman years. So 10,000 women take a pill for one year, three of them are gonna have a VTE. The risk doubles if you add a birth control pill, okay? Now it's six per 10,000 woman years. If you take a pill with drospirinone containing products, what we've learned is that risk may even be as high as nine or 10 per 10,000 woman years. And I tell you, I use those numbers almost every day in clinic. And it's not always to convince somebody to stay on their drospirinone, sometimes it is. And by the way, remember the highest risk time period for a VTE is in the first six months of treatment. When your patient calls you on the phone and says, hey, somebody told me that these drospirinone pills are, are associated with a higher risk of uh, blood clot, should I stop it? If they've already been on it for a year, they have proved themselves to be an excellent candidate for this. And then you can also put it in perspective by knowing some of those numbers. 
let's look at the data. This, there's many studies that look at, at whether or not there even is an increased risk, but this study did show an increased risk, and in the interest of time, let's go down to the, the bottom two bullets. So this study, one thing they did differently here, and it's even not what I was just talking about with the 369. With the 369, we're talking about all comers of VTE. Here, if there was a VTE, but there had been a surgery or a period of immobilization or anything else that might have been a causative link, they excluded those people. So the numbers here look really, really low. Second from the bottom here, the incident rate of a VTE and somebody on a birth control pill with drospironone was about 30 per 100,000 or three per 10,000 woman years. Bottom bullet, but if they were on a pill with levonorgestrel, it was half that. It was 12 per 100,000 or 1.25 per 10,000. I don't wanna get lost in the numbers, but you, when you look at the real numbers, 12 to 30 out of 100,000, but then the take home message from the article is the risk is twice. Those sound really different, don't they? The risk is doubled and I want you to be able to put it in perspective. This is probably the last thing, well, second to last thing I'm gonna have you circle and star. You might even take a picture of this with your phone. I think it's that important. You know how we said if you're using these for contraception, you win every time from a risk standpoint? Okay, so their numbers are a little different than mine, but look at pregnancy third trimester. What is your risk of a blood clot? 12 per 10,000. Around the time of delivery, 30 per 10,000. We have not yet set a number that high. So again, if somebody's using these for contraception, good. I think where I have changed my practice based on some of this is in that young person who's never before been on a pill. They look at me, I believe them, they don't need contraception. It has changed a little bit maybe where I start. I still use drospironone containing products, but I'm not as likely to use them in the youngest patient who's never been on a pill before as a first choice. What did our FDA say? They did their own study. They too found an increased risk. And if you read the quote there, it's basically what I've already said two times. This is from FDA.gov. To put this into perspective, if the risk of developing a blood clot among women using oral contraceptives is about six in 10,000, then the risk of developing a blood clot among women using drospironone containing oral contraceptives would be about 10 in 10,000. And because I'm gonna get the hook, we're gonna go to the very last slide star this, this is the last one. This is, take a history. You know, we have to be smart when we're using any drug. Uh, let's look at the contraindications. Pregnancy, well that's a no-brainer, but we should still ask. Breast cancer is a contraindication, but only current. Breastfeeding and less than six weeks postpartum. Well, why? Probably because what we just talked about, the risk of VTE is so high in that time period anyway, why would we add another risk factor? age greater than 35 and a heavy smoker. Smoking is all about increasing that risk of myocardial infarction and stroke. It's the arterial side. Somebody who smokes cigarettes is not gonna get a birth control pill from me. Hypertension, same thing. Diabetes, DVT, history or current, history of heart disease, history of stroke, all of those things would mean you're not getting it from me. Migraines, if you read the fine print here, there are some that we can safely use these in. Well, they're not gonna get them from the dermatologist, in my opinion. If you have migraines, that's enough for me to refer you out and let somebody else be involved with that. And then cirrhosis or liver tumor. So I hope that's given you three or maybe four or five bullets to take home to help you uh, treat your adult female patients and your adult patients of all ages more effectively. Thank you. <laughs>